Hello, everyone. Welcome to the CRAW Undergrad Town Hall. This evening, we've got Preeti Bargava, and she's going to tell us all about inferring users' context from their smartphone data. Just to review the logistics a little more, make sure that uh, we will have, if you have any questions at all throughout the session, that you uh, uh, type your questions in the Q&A box and either the speaker, if we're going live at that point with her stopping for questions, or someone behind the scenes will actually answer your questions. So we encourage lots of questions throughout. Don't wait till the end. We are also going to stop here and there throughout the presentation and have some polls so that we can hear from you. Uh, we like to get feedback from you, and sometimes it, it gives the speaker some idea of which direction to go. So. These polls will pop up. All you need to do is click on an answer and hit submit, and then you'll get to see the aggregated re results of, of everyone. So it uh, makes it a little more interactive. So today we have Preeti. I am actually Lori Pollock, and I'm at the University of Delaware hosting this event. Uh, I am one of the co-organizers of the um, CRAW Undergrad Town Hall event. Series. So if you have suggestions for other speakers, please let us know at the end. We're always listening, waiting to hear for more good uh, examples of speakers. Today we have Preeti Bargava, and she is a senior research scientist at Lithium Technologies. I'm going to leave, give it over to Preeti and let her give you more information about her own background. So go, Preeti. Thanks, Laurie. Uh, so, as Laurie introduced me, I'm a senior research engineer in the data science team at Lithium Technologies in San Francisco. Um, I got my PhD in computer science from the University of Maryland College Park. My advisor was uh, Professor Ashok Agrawala. And uh, before that, I was uh, a senior member of technical staff at Oracle India in uh, Noida, India. And uh, before that, I completed my bachelor's of engineering in information technology. During my PhD, I did about like three internships, one at the Rock Park and two at Samsung Resource America. And uh, if you want to know more about me, my website is mentioned at the bottom of the slide, so you can like, look it up, or you can email me if you want. My email address is also there. So let's get started. Um, so my PhD research focus was more on uh, like three different areas. My dissertation was on proactive context-aware computing and systems. And as part of my dissertation, I worked in uh, three areas, mobile and ubiquitous systems, personalization recommender systems, and user modeling. So my dissertation was uh, at the junction of AI systems and API. And uh, it, it was like, it's a really exciting area to work in. And that's what I'll be actually talking about, like a small piece of my dissertation uh, in this presentation. Uh, all my papers and posters are on my website again, so you can go and look them up if you're really interested. Just to mention what I'm currently working on, my current research is on extracting rich information from noisy user-generated text uh, from on social media. So Lithium uh, Technologies uh, slash Cloud, we analyze a lot of social media to understand what people are talking about, like you know the entities they are talking about, like people, places, and things topics they are interested in, and we uh, do this uh, from like uh, people's social media profiles. And I published some work on this uh, as well. Uh, these are all like at, uh, WWF 2017 workshops. One was recently at the MNLC 2017 workshop, and there's a forthcoming paper. Uh, and my posters and papers are also like on my website. Uh, so if you want to know more about like my current research work, you can go there and uh, look it up. So let's get started with the research talk and then uh, the mentoring talk. So my research talk is to, uh, today is on inferring users' context from uh, smartphone data. And I'll explain what context means and how we can infer it from uh, smartphone data. So context has uh, been given uh, different dimensions, but the one uh, different definitions, but the one that's uh, like most acceptable is that any information that can be used to characterize the situation of an entity. Uh, there are multiple dimensions to users' context, like who the user is, basically what do we know about him or her, uh, preferences, interests, demographics, where is the user, uh, that's basically uh, location, what the user is doing, that's like, you know, like physical activity, or it could also be like activity on a device, uh, when that's the time dimension, and who is the user around, uh, or like who's the user with, that's uh, people around them. So uh, this, these different, like five different dimensions sum up the context of the user. And uh, 
But to model user's context, you can have a lot of data sources. That smartphone data is basically uh, like really rich uh, because people carry their smartphones all the time with them. So it's really a nice window to look into uh, what the user and their context are, like you know where they are going, what are, who are they hanging out with, what do they really like, and things like that. Uh, there you can send powerful devices. They have a multitude of sensors like GPS, accelerometer, Wi-Fi, etc. They and now smartphones like uh, they are more powerful than anything. Uh, a lot of devices that you had like 10 years ago, you literally carry like a mini computer in your uh, pocket. So they have an increasing range of computational uh, storage and communication capabilities. And as a result, they make a very good source of uh, information to infer several dimensions of the user's context and also like to deliver information to the user. So if you want to like infer this information, but then what you do with it. So you are basically are going to deliver some information to the user, like you know, recommendations, personalized recommendations, or some relevant information to them. So on, in my current talk, I will focus on two uh, dimensions mostly in the interest of time because this is a vast area. And I really encourage people to go and look it up. But I'll be focusing more on inferring location and activities of the user from the smartphone data. Uh, that brings us to our first polling question. Uh, how many sensors can you count on your smartphone? Uh, and they, these are like different options, like are they 0 to 5, between 5 and 10, between 10 and 15, 15 to 20, or more than 20. So just count the sensors on your smartphone and uh, submit the answer. Okay, so we have the polling answers now. We have the results. So 56% of the participants think they have about five to 10 sensors on their smartphone. 12% think between 15 and 20. 19% think between, uh, I'm sorry, more than 20, I think that should be. And then 12% think between zero to five. And uh, let me show you a little graphic and then you'll see how many sensors are actually there on your smartphone. So this is an old graphic. Uh, but I think it pretty well captures how many sensors are actually there on your smartphone, like you know, light, proximity, camera, touch, position, basically GPS and Wi-Fi, accelerometer, magnetometer. So about 19 uh, sensors in all, and they keep coming. So every uh, phone comes with more sensors. So I think I would say the latest iPhone would have at least about 25 sensors. So let's move on to like the first dimension that you can infer from uh, smartphone data, which is basically where is the user and that's location. So location could mean outdoors and indoors as well. So, and for outdoor localization, GPS is the de facto technology. Uh, uh, it's like very accurate. It's available, like, readily available, it's ubiquitous. So uh, people don't really work on that. But for indoors, they are there have been like a lot of work with people trying to come up with new technologies to figure out where the user is like inside a building and like which floor, where exactly which room. So the people are working with like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, RFID, NFC, uh, you know, with like tags around the building to say uh, where the user is. Uh, but there's still like several challenges in this area. One, uh, the system should have low cost of deployment and maintenance. And a lot of these systems require like proprietary hardware or a lot of calibration. So it, it, it's a huge challenge uh, to have a system with like uh, low, uh, which is very easily deployable and very maintainable. Uh, you need to balance uh, calibration and accuracy. So calibration, I'll explain uh, what calibration means when I talk about like some of the techniques using Wi-Fi. But uh, to localize a user in indoor environment, you do need to like uh, calibrate your system very well, uh, and because it has to be accurate. Uh, also, if something changes in the environment, like the number of people or environment factors, like even humidity can have uh, some, uh, uh, an effect on some of the systems, or like the number of uh, people or the furniture is changed, like moved around, that can uh, like throw up your system. And also, like these systems need to work in multi-story environment. And most of the works now have so far focused that uh, on one floor, where they uh, figure out that okay, if you know the user on uh, is on this floor, then where on the floor is the user? Uh, like this, uh, a very accurate technique to do this is Wi-Fi fingerprinting, which is uh, uh, like some of the systems being radar and Horus. Um, so these are slightly old. People have been working on Wi-Fi, but these were like the seminal systems that actually started working on Wi-Fi fingerprinting. So fingerprinting is basically you take a device like a laptop or a mobile phone, and you go around the building and you take measurements of Wi-Fi signal strength, and then you drop a histogram and you say. When a new sample comes in, where exactly uh, like the user is based on how the sample matches with the histogram, that's uh, a very high-level overview of fingerprinting. But people make optimizations as well in this. Uh, still, 
the basic principle of uh, fingerprinting requires this calibration effort, which is uh, very costly because you need people like manually, somebody doing this, and then also it's expensive to set up and maintain. Because if anything changes in the environment, like you know, you move one bypass by point uh, to another, uh, it will ba basically uh, cause your system uh, like a lo lot of errors in your uh, in your uh, co computation. So it's yeah, you need to like recalibrate the map again, and it's not like robust to uh, environment changes as I mentioned. There are some Bluetooth-based uh, solutions like iBeacon, which is basically having uh, Bluetooth uh, proprietary Bluetooth uh, beacons all over the building, and then based on how, which Bluetooth con you're close to, uh, the user is localized. Um, again, it, it requires a lot of proprietary hardware. Uh, there have been some works on flow determination, but most of them uh, require like user input or they're not very accurate. So this basically motivated me to work on a system called Locus, which is, which is to address all these different challenges. So you know, like the system needs to be calibration free. So Locus is calibration free, requires minimal setup. It's robust. It has room level accuracy. We do both floor and uh, location determination. So it, it, we tried, we tested it in multi-story buildings, and it worked uh, very well. And we use knowledge of uh, the infrastructure, like buildings, rooms, access point information, uh, and we just like store this in a database, and that's all you need to do in uh, calibration. I think we deployed and tested this on the UMD campus, which is about 220 buildings and uh, 4,500 access points. Uh, I'll share some of the results that we got from this uh, environment. And it's designed to enable like several location-based services uh, because if you localize the user, what are you going to do with that location? So there are like these apps or services that are built on top of this, and these are called location-based services like indoor navigation, uh, uh, tracking in emergency scenarios. So it's designed to enable these uh, services. So this is a high-level overview of the uh, local system. Uh, basically, a, small, a smartphone or like an uh, a, a device would scan the environment and send the Wi-Fi scan data like RSSI, MAC information, and uh, SSID, which is a signal strength, uh, which is, sorry, the, uh, the identifying RSSI is the signal strength uh, to the local server. And the local server basically has an algorithm that computes uh, things like, you know, what is the floor, what is the uh, room number, building address, and X and Y coordinate of the device and sends that uh, back to it to display it to the user. So this is a very high level overview. The, uh, previous slide mentioned my papers, uh, so all the details of the algorithm and the experiments are actually in the papers, so if you're really interested, you can go and look them up. So Locus has certain benefits, like I mentioned, because we build a system to address some of the challenges that uh, some uh, existing technologies presented. So the average floor accuracy is more than 95%, so about like 95% of the time we get the correct floor. The location error is less than 6.5 meters, which is about room level accuracy. So some people would argue that it's a little too high because you are expected to have very uh, high accuracy. But uh, in, uh, in, in, in our defense, I would say that because we are working, uh, we're trying to build a system that requires no calibration or maintenance and just enable like uh, a sort of uh, location-based services that need uh, room level accuracy, it, it's actually uh, good enough. Uh, it's one of the first uh, calibration free systems for uh, floor and location de determination. We did not require like user input for the floor. No setup deployment or maintenance expenses. It was just to environment changes. So, like you can see, it addressed a lot of these uh, challenges that uh, existing technologies uh, basically uh, uh, did not solve. So uh, that's where like Locus was what, what Locus was trying to do. Uh, as I mentioned, like indoor localization uh, has like a lot of applications. So one, the biggest application is indoor navigation. You, know, you can navigate in like malls, airports, and things like that. So Google actually, uh, I think, has come up with such systems like that. But uh, still, I mean, we don't have indoor maps available uh, readily. So th that's like one of the challenges uh, and one of the areas that you know people should really work on how to build uh, indoor maps of. Uh, you know, like public places, even parking lots, to try to uh, navigate the user. Um, one another big application is in retail. You know, you're walking around in a mall, you're close to a store, and the store, and if you're a regular customer of the store, the store could give you like coupons, you know, based on your proximity because the store knows that you are close to uh, them. So you know, hey, how about coming in and having a coffee or something like that? And then a really important application of uh, the system is that it can be used in emergency scenario. So if somebody makes a 911 call. And uh, for the uh, you know like the dispatcher and the and the responders to find them like in a tall build like 15 story building where they are and in which room it's uh, it's really important to know their uh, indoor location like right from the room number and floor and the building they are in and similarly goes for like tracking patients in a hospital and you can like think of many many such applications and you know like work on these things. 
So that brings us to our second poll question. Um, if such a localization system were to share your location with your friends on a social network, let's say it's trying to be like a friend finder application, would you use it? Uh, and here are the four options. So while, while the poll results come in, let, let me talk about the uh, next dimension, which is basically activities. Like I said, I'll be focusing mostly on the two dimensions, which is location and then activities. So activity recognition basically uh, is uh, what is the user doing? This could be like, you know, physical activity like walking, running, uh, you're driving or things like that, or you're stationary, or it could be what you're doing on your device. So uh, there, there are certain challenges involved in activity recognition. One, because you, if you're trying to monitor or like something for the user's activity, uh, at every second it needs to be embedded in a device that the user carries. So a smartphone is a very uh, obvious um, uh, it's a very obvious alternative to this. Uh, and also, like, the system that's inferring the user's activity needs to be robust. Uh, and it should not depend on, like, you know, different, the different users have gates, uh, different gates. Oh, so we have the polling results uh, from uh, the poll that we have, like, using the uh, lo location app that shares uh, location with friends. And, the, and most people, majority of the people, like, about 40% of the people said maybe. And 35% said no, understandably like they are privacy concerns. 10% 10 uh, 10 people said yes, uh, they would use it. And 15% uh, responded like they're not sure if they would, uh, they would use it. So they are, yes, they, I would agree that there are privacy concerns to sharing location uh, with even your friends on a social network. So uh, that's why some of friend, friend, uh, fi uh, friend finders app do not uh, really uh, take off with uh, a lot of users. So coming back to activity uh, recognition, uh, the app needs to be, or, or the system needs to be power efficient. So if you have, like, you know, a small app or a system running on the user's uh, smartphone, you do not want to drain the poor user's uh, battery. Uh, and then it needs to, like, infer the activity in a non-invasive manner. Uh, you know, just run it, run it in the background while the user go, goes about uh, his or her day-to-day -day activities. It needs to be scalable for, like, different users and privacy preserving. As you see, a lot of, like, when you're inferring uh, uh, things about the user from the smartphone data, privacy plays a huge factor. Uh, but there's still like not a lot of research in this area, and uh, research like still being con conducted. But and people still use apps and uh, systems that uh, basically send data to like servers or things like that. And there, there's like some privacy information. So uh, there are like several works in this area, and each work has focused on like one dimension. So a work called IO Detector focused on just detecting like indoor outdoors. Uh, uh, environmental of these, whether you know, use it indoor, whether you use it outdoor, or uh, like in the indoor outdoor area. And this app, uh, this uh, system used uh, like light and magnetic field sensors and cell tower signals. Uh, basically, uh, the disadvantage of the system was that it had a dependency on the device manufacturer, like who manufactured the smartphone or the tablet on which the uh, system was running, and then also like uh, the sensor output varies with time of the day and weather. Uh, then there have been systems that just did, like, physical activity recognition, physical activity meaning, uh, you know, like walking, running, or driving, things like that. Uh, so these two systems, Sentry and uh, Jigsaw, uh, they had latency and privacy challenges because they were sending uh, data to a backend server. So some of the users they did pilot to it said that uh, this is not acceptable. And, of course, like, there was some calibration required because of the uh, – uh, because they were using the accelerometer, so you need calibration for, like, gate, position, or orientation. Uh, for social context recognition, social context means like who is around the user, as I mentioned, you know, like how many people or who the user is with. Uh, essentially, we're using Bluetooth and location sharing, but again, uh, this is a huge invasion of uh, privacy, so uh, that, that's a disadvantage of the system. And then for device activity recognition, uh, there, are, there have been some uh, systems that I've worked on, like predicting what the next app the user would use, uh, but like the most frequently used or the most, most recently used app. But not so much on inferring what the user is using currently and how does it affect the other dimension. So as part of my research and, uh, and my PhD work, I built a system called SenseMe, which is an on-device system that recognizes five dimensions of the user's context. So all the different dimensions that I mentioned are recognized by SenseMe. Uh, environmental context, which is basically whether the user is indoor, outdoor, or indoor-outdoor. Uh, like that's the gray line between indoors and outdoors. So you need to have that uh, state. And if you read my paper, actually, uh, you'll understand why that state is important. Uh, we recognize like four uh, different uh, values for like physical activity. If the user like stationary, walking, uh, running in vehicles, which is like the user could be like in a bus or public transport or he or she could be driving. 
uh, context aware location, that's the third dimension that we infer. Uh, and this is the set of locations determined by Wi Fi uh, indoor. So we actually use the local system that I just described for uh, indoor location, and GPS, as I mentioned, is the de facto standard for outdoor location. Uh, we also infer the user device activity, which is the task that the user is engaged in, like currently, you know, either you are like on a call or you are messaging or you are on WhatsApp. Uh, and we also infer social context, which is the number of people around the user. We did not infer like who exactly the user was around, but just like how many people were around the user. So this is the architecture of the Sentry system. Basically, we built an Android service, and uh, this uh, service had like five different like sub services, which were uh, inferring each context of the user, and for inferring the, the five different uh, dimensions. We used data from several sensors on, on, uh, on the device, like GPS, Wi-Fi, rotation vector, actual meter, and uh, Bluetooth. And then uh, after inferring, uh, so there, there were like a bunch of algorithms that would uh, run inside the service. And after inferring the user's uh, context, the data like you know, location, physical activity, and other dimensions that are inferred were placed in Sensei DB, which is like this is a SQLite DB that was running on the uh, that is basically stored on the device and then rendered on the front-end application there by SenseMeWiz, which was like a prototype uh, front-end visualization. So a sample of like what this app can infer is basically the user is indoors, that's his, um, that's his or our environmental context, stationary, that's basically the physical activity, then you know, like the device activity is phone call, uh, location is Avery Williams Building College Park, which is my department basically in, um, when I was at UMD, and then you know, the number of people being like the four people. So for each uh, user, like per second, we are basically inferring this information and storing it on the device, and then we would render it on the front end application layer. Uh, so this is what actually uh, a prototype visualization of Sensei is. So the the bars uh, explains the environmental context and the social context. So here we have like different colors. So blue means the person was indoors, green means the person was outdoors, and uh, we had a different color for like indoor outdoor area. The thickness of the bar basically explains like how many people are around the user. So social context. So this can like if you just look at the visualization, like for let's say for the past one hour, you can figure out like where you were, what you were doing, how many people were around you, how much time you spent indoors versus outdoors. Like in the outdoor area, the person is driving, then walking, and then gets home. So this visualization effectively sums up the five different. Um, dimensions that we were capturing. And on the uh, right hand side, you can see we also capture the device activity. So for a while, the person used like maps and uh, Gmail apps. So it's a, it's a nice like quantified cell. But there are multiple users to this. Uh, they You can use this information uh, for like predicting the next activity a user would be doing, the next location the user would be at, and also like how the different dimensions affect each other. But this work was mostly on just inferring the uh, different dimensions, like uh, the location and uh, uh, the environmental context and physical activity. So, since we, uh, when I just talk about the uh, the experiments that we did, we tested sensory with like about 15 users. We gave the app to them and asked them to run it in the background on their uh, devices for like 15 uh, days. And then uh, also they maintained uh, like a logbook where they. Uh, gave us the ground truth data, which is basically uh, what they were actually doing. And then we also got the sensory DB from their uh, devices, which ex effectively explained what the app imported. And then we compared the accuracy of the app versus uh, the ground truth that the users gave us. And uh, overall, the accuracy of the uh, system was pretty good, and it beat some of the closest baselines. For some of the dimensions, we did not really have a baseline. So uh, that's why uh, there's nothing mentioned in these columns. So as I mentioned initially, like some of these uh, applications or systems have like several challenges that they need to address if they are actually uh, doing this multidimensional context and activity recognition. And since we effectively address those challenges, um, they it's uh, it is like it, it's very power efficient. It uses power conservation techniques. It's uh, calibration free. So they, the users do not need any uh, orientation, uh, like uh, do not need any calibration for uh, their body, uh, like gait uh, or uh, or where they keep their phone, or you know, like time, weather, or anything. Uh, it would just install on the device, and then it would run. It, uh, the app was very scalable, and we tested it with like 15 different users with varied mobility patterns and schedules. Uh, none of the services that I described depended on like uh, sensors that were like specifically on a device, or uh, you know, uh, needed some proprietary thing. Uh, minimum latency and privacy preserving. So all computation is carried out on the device. Like I said, it's, a, it's an on-device system, so we did not 
transfer any data to like a backend server for any computation. And as a result, like uh, the latency is low and uh, the privacy of the user is preserved and it's non invasive. So it runs in the background, collect and sort the user's data. So that brings us to poll question three. Uh, like I described, sensing is an on device system. So remember, on device being uh, everything, all the data that it's capturing and all the computation it is doing is on your device. It's not sending anything to a server or cloud. But if a similar system stored your data on a server or cloud, would you use it? So while the poll results come in, let me continue uh, with the talk. Okay, so yeah, so that was my research talk, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions now. Hey, Preeti, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I have, uh, we've gotten some questions, and I've mm -hmm. passed them along through the chat. Okay. If you look at the chat, one of the Sure. One of the questions is how do you ensure privacy when analyzing such personal data? Why do I want to be stalked? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like that, uh, the question, oh, I think you got the polling as well. Uh, okay, so like the question was that basically uh, would you use a system that stored your device, your data on a, a cloud or a server. So majority of our uh, participants, like about 47% said no, and about 40% said maybe uh, nobody said yes. 7% uh, were unsure. So yeah, so go, to go back to answering the uh, question, um, like I said, so for, uh, let me answer the question in two, uh, two parts because I uh, described two different systems. Uh, so the first one, which is effectively an indoor localized system, so it's not uh, just about, uh, see there, like I said, uh, a, a big portion of it is tracking, uh, like, you know, seniors or elderly patients in, uh, in the, uh, who are, like, in a hospital or, like, you know, in an elderly care facility. And if, you know, somebody's sick or they need to contact someone uh, for, like, emergency care, then how do you locate them? In that case, it's important for them to share their location because it's actually beneficial for them. And uh, as I said, most of the time, uh, if a user, it's like the user consents to sharing his or her location so that, you know, they can get coupons or things like that from uh, lots of stores. Or, you know, we share location every day with Google when we use Google Maps. So because it, it's our advantage and it's like for our benefit, we can use Google Maps to navigate our way. So that is why like people are willing to share uh, location. But yes, you would not want to share your location with like a friend on a social network, which is why I think most people answer that they would not want to share it. So of course, you don't want to get stalked at that, uh, you know, like if you're sharing it with just some stranger. But I most people feel totally comfortable sharing it with, you know, with companies like Google Maps. Uh, you know, you use Google Maps every day. Mm -hmm. And then the second system, basically, it's an on-device system. So, of course, no data is being shared with anybody. Everything is on your device, on your phone. But I know a lot of apps out there don't do it just on device. Right? So there, there's a big debate about you know, privacy when it comes to uh, you know, continuing users. I mean, it's a great advantage. There's a lot of great uses of it. But you have to be comfortable with sharing absolutely, the information absolutely. for that use. Yes. yes. Right. Well, another question. Uh, that came in was what background does someone need to do this kind of research? Like, what kind of background did you have coming into this? Uh, sure. Like, I think in my first slide, I mentioned like the first couple of slides that our work I did in my PhD was at the junction of uh, AI systems and API. So that's actually where the research lies. But when I came into uh, uh, my when I started my PhD, I did not really have a background in any of these. I just learned it like along the way. But definitely having a computer science background and an algorithm background, uh, a bit of the statistics and things like that helps. And you can like learn uh, along the way. Like I, like I took machine learning courses, I took API courses, I, I did a, I built a lot of systems. So yes, the coming is a, a big uh, prerequisite. And the coding skills definitely help. Okay, um, let's see. All right, I think we should move on to mentoring because you have some really valuable information to share. Okay, if you okay. still have questions, then I think we'll just uh, encourage participants to continue to ask, send in questions as, as you're uh, going through the mentoring. Uh, sure. So I'll move on to the mentoring talk now. 
So uh, my mentoring staff is going to, uh, going to be on graduate school application and admission process, uh, and uh, there are two parts to it. But I will do the first part briefly because uh, which, which is effectively how to go from a CS undergraduate to a PhD program because there have been a lot of undergraduate town halls before, and I'll mention a couple that I saw on the website, and they are like great. There's great material in them, and those will like really help you if you're planning to go to a PhD program. And I'll focus most of my time on. Uh, what does graduate school look like for computer students? Uh, you know, what are the key milestones and how do you achieve them? So, uh, first step to, of course, like going from an undergraduate to a CS graduate program is getting involved in undergraduate research. It really helps, and I'll uh, describe some of the benefits. Uh, but to, if you want to get involved in undergraduate research, there's an excellent uh, undergraduate town hall on December 1st by Kathleen. Uh, so, you, I would like recommend that you go and check it out. Other then that there's plenty of information available on the web on like CREW programs like CREU, there is DREU, and uh, I think in Europe there is a uh, DAD program. So you should like check these out, and then if you want to like uh, uh, do an internship, you can apply to these programs. Uh, and if you don't, like suppose you would just want to work with a professor at your school, just email the professors or like, you know, check out their websites or go and talk to their students uh, and ask, uh, or like, you know, like, as a professor, if they can allow you to work uh, through the summer or something like that, or in one of the classes. Uh, and I would definitely recommend like interning or trying to publish your research. So I know like undergraduates uh, can intern in uh, let's say even like Google or a lot of other companies here, and then try to publish their uh, research. Uh, for starters, I would say you could also attend uh, conferences. So Grace Hopper has a research track. Uh, go and attend that, or you could like you know if you have some work done, you could go and present at the research track. Uh, and there are lots of labs and companies in the career fair. So if you're just looking to get started, you can go and uh, talk to those companies. And uh, if you want to get noticed by people, like maintain an updated web page and uh, portfolio, that would really uh, help uh, where you can list your projects, your publications. You know. It's easy for then people to find you and contact you, and then you know, they know what you're working on. Uh, so some of the benefits for getting involved in undergraduate research is, uh, and I'm sure some of you already know it, it's basically you realize that like research, uh, like uh, I as an undergrad actually uh, did uh, a couple of internships, uh, like research internships, and I published my work, and I, and I realized I liked it. Uh, I just thought uh, sure, I wanted to do a PhD right away after my uh, like undergrad degree, or I wanted to take some time off and work in the industry. So gives you that understanding, you know, whether you like research or not. Uh, and also it gives you an edge when you're applying to graduate programs because it shows that you have the ability to conduct independent research. You get recommended by the supervisor or the professor you work with. So uh, definitely that's uh, a huge advantage because that's that will be your graduate school application. And if you can publish work, uh, that that be like uh, that that be like awesome. Uh, then you can actually demonstrate that what you did uh, made a small contribution uh, to you know whatever field you're working in. It was important research. So it helps with all, all of this. Uh, so that brings us to our poll question uh, four. Uh, have you like have any of you undertaken any independent research as an undergraduate? Uh, and uh, have four options where you did it as a internship, as a research lab at your school, as part of your undergraduate curriculum or over a summer or like you know, the CRAW or some other program. So while the poll results are coming in, let me uh, continue with the presentation, and then once the results are here, I'll share them. So uh, to go from a CS undergraduate to a PhD program, uh, let's say you have a research background and you decide to uh, go, uh, you decide to apply for a PhD uh, program. What's the first step you do? You have to pick university. So I actually picked my universities uh, from US News, and I think it's a great source because you know what the ranking, uh, university ranking out there is, like in computer science and in uh, specific disciplines, like artificial intelligence systems, API. Uh, I think that's about, about uh, a few the top ten, and like uh, next two in like in the ten to twenty uh, rankings, and then that's how I apply. And of course, like uh, you have to check out uh, specific departments and the professors that are. Uh, working there because we need to know which professor you would be working with or like who you're interested in working with and then clearly like when you're applying there you, you would mention that in your statement of purpose, you know, like this is these are the areas I want to work in or these are the professors I want to work with. Uh, shortlist about ten schools I would say that's a good uh, school, but if you want to go for more, like definitely go for more. But I think ten is a good number and distribute like masters and PhD applications because 
some schools may you know accept you for a master's or some schools like accept you for directly for a PhD after an undergraduate degree. So it really depends on the school you're applying to. Uh, application materials was again covered in detail in a previous undergraduate town hall by Nia, so I would just briefly like list them out there. Uh, on my website, I have some resources if uh, they want to go and uh, check out my uh, website. Uh, I list like all the uh, resources and uh, some uh, uh, useful links for you know like writing your talk or generally uh, what should you be uh, looking at when you are uh, when are you when you are applying for a PhD uh, program. So the main uh, Items are like your general application, uh, statement of purpose, that's like the uh, most important uh, piece of your uh, graduate school application, I would say, because there you outline what you will be working on, what you've done so far, and how this has led up, for, led up uh, to you applying to this school, to the department, and working with the professor. You need like uh, recommendations from your, uh, you know, like professors, if you're working from your supervisors or managers, or, uh, you know, Anybody you've worked with who can uh, vouch for, uh, you know, like your ability to do research, write papers, things like that. Uh, you need transcripts from your undergraduate school. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you have scores here in the United States, but uh, I, I was an international student, so I had to undertake the GRD and the uh, test of English as a foreign language, and I sent this scores down. Uh, you need your CV and, of course, like the application fee. So. I'll cover the second part now in detail, which is basically what does graduate school look like in CS and what is the uh, milestones. Uh, here is a general timeline, and uh, this is a disclaimer. This may vary across schools and departments. It's a very high uh, level overview of milestones, uh, but it's pretty much the same in uh, most schools. So that you know, like a couple of things may vary here and there. Uh, in your first or like first one and a half year, you. Uh, typically finish your coursework, you find a research topic and an advisor uh, whom you would be working with. Then from year two to year four, you start your research, you start publishing, or like, uh, you know, you go and go to conferences, you get off there, you present your work. Some schools may require a qualifying exam, which you typically give in year three. Um, and uh, I don't have a lot of background in this because I did not give one, like my department did not require one. But when you are at a PhD program, you would, your department will give you all the information you need. But, uh, by end of year four, you propose your thesis, you write it up, you present it to a company. Uh, year five to six, you typically finish your research, and then uh, at the end of year six, which is a usual uh, timeline for most uh, PhD students, but you, know, you may finish it earlier, you may finish it later, it can vary. Uh, you define your thesis. And I would re uh, recommend highly having a plan like A and B for these six years because you don't want it to be stressful. So have a plan, have some goals. That, you know, this is what I wanted to ask. Uh, this is how I want to do. Oh, so we got the polling uh, results of the um, the poll question that I asked. That how many people have undertaken? Uh, and let me see. And let's see. What were the options? Okay, so 47 said, oh, oh, that's great. That 47 percent have done some under, uh, independent research as an undergraduate uh, at a research lab. Uh, about 24% uh, said yes over a summer to an external program. 12% uh, people have not undertaken any research, and about 6% say as part of an industry internship, and 6% as part of uh, their undergraduate uh, curriculum. So we have a lot of people on the talk who, uh, as participants, who have undertaken uh, research, which is great. So you know, like you guys are like set to go to the PhD program if you're interested. So uh, yeah, so as I said, like. Just have a plan A and B for these six years, and then you know, once you have a plan, you just like set your milestones, you set your goals based on you know what the department requires, what your advisor wants, and uh, then you go about it. So, what are the key milestones in a PhD? Uh, first, the biggest milestone is of course like finding an advisor, uh, because that person is going to be the guide, your guide for the rest of your graduate school uh, journey. So you have to like choose wisely. You know, your interests should match, and what you're working on should be. Uh, you know, interesting to that person, to, to the advisor, as well as uh, to you. Uh, so one way to find that is like, you know, you attend uh, that person, like that professor's classes, you read his or her papers, you go and talk to his or her students. And other factors uh, that don't matter so much, but I would still say are important are that, you know, like that person's lab, uh, you know, like group should have a consistent working atmosphere and relationship between different people. Uh, you may also want to check out like the size of the research group because, uh, you know, like I worked in a small research group, and I really liked that because we had a lot of independence, and I had more 
one-on-one -on -one time with my advisor, but some people may like to work in a bigger research group where you can get a lot of cross references, you can work on a lot more projects, but then you don't get so much time, like one-on-one you know, -on -one time with your advisor. So it really depends on your expenses. Uh, funding, of course, because uh, nobody can spend their own money to do for like six years of for graduate school, so you need fund to be funded, like having a, a research assistantship, a teaching assistantship uh, uh, for like uh, most uh, periods. And then talk to like other students, you know, other students who want to join with you, uh, like you just started, or other students on like second or third year. So just to get an idea of like who, what you're interested in, who would be a good professor to uh, work in that area. So now that you have an advisor, that person will advise you and also like you up towards finding a research problem. So research problems you like that you're interested in because you don't want to do work that you're not interested in for like six years. And then it should be something that you can contribute to because your thesis, your PhD dissertation at the end of it should be a novel and significant contribution to computer science. So it has it's really important that the start of the problem you pick has you know, scope for all these different things. Uh, one way to go about it is like we recently published papers. Um, you discuss with your research group, your peers, your seniors, your advisor, and you know you come up with like some problem that you would be interested in. Uh, another way to find a problem is take courses relevant to your research. Take a lot of courses in like machine learning, natural language processing, system courses, information visualization, API systems. So I took like different courses in my first one and a half years to sort of figure out what I wanted to work in, and then once I settled on that, I you know, I work towards like I work through the different problems. I if and I if I a course to let's say contribute more, or let's say an advanced machine learning or you know NLP course, go ahead and do it. I think that that really helps. Uh, attend conferences. So whatever area you're working in, they're typically like you know uh, top conferences in each area. Like in this room, there are top conferences in HCI, There is Sky. There is Net. There is ITM. There is a lot. There are a lot of conferences in. Um, Machine learning. So find the top conference and attend them. If you cannot attend them, just go through their papers. And you know, like every year they put out the papers, just go through them and see what's the current like state of the art, and then uh, some problems to work on. And uh, like a couple of tips here. Uh, one, uh, a lot of professors and researchers uh, they maintain a calendar of upcoming conferences and deadlines. So go and check it out. They tell you how the conferences are paid, which are the top conferences you should be checking out and you could attend. And also, like, search for conference rankings. There are no official conference rankings in computer science, but a lot of people maintain an official conference ranking. So you get to know, like, what the top tier was A plus A and uh, tier B, tier B plus uh, conferences. So now you have an advisor and you have a research problem, but you also need to worry about funding because you are going to be in graduate school for, let's say, a minimum of, like, four or five years at least. So you need to have funding for these years. Um, so the first thing I, I did was find a lot of scholarships and fellowships at my school or, you know, by like private organizations. So there are like several government and private organizations. Uh, there are lots of companies that sponsor awards, scholarships and fellowships. Google, Facebook, IBM, Microsoft, uh, these are like uh, four big companies which have like two-year fellowships where you could apply for them. Um, NSF, uh, DOE, they have like uh, two-year fellowships, I believe. Uh, you should like check out, uh, check out the web pages of these um, agencies to see what the fellowship requirements are. But I think for some of them, they might be requirements about citizenship and uh, you know, permanent residency status. So definitely check those out. Uh, another thing that really helps is you could write a co-write a grant proposal with your advisor. Uh, even if you are not the author, but one, it helps you get funding. Two, it really helps if you're going to pursue a career in the uh, in, in the academia. So I actually co-wrote a proposal, uh, like a a grant proposal with my advisor uh, for a uh, Samsung GRO, and we got funded for like two years. So that was basically the source of my funding for a couple of years. So it really helps uh, doing all these things. And like if you're attending conferences, you apply for travel grants. There are lots of travel grants uh, for like uh, people who want to attend conferences within your school, even outside uh, in Kira funding those. So apply for those. Uh, there's a list of scholarships, fellowships, and travel grants like on my webpage. So, you know, if, you, if you're doing a PhD or if you're interested in finding about uh, this more, like, you can go and uh, look it up. So, now that you've been working in this area for a while, you have funding, you have a research uh, a problem that you're working on, you need to publish that research. And because that's the only way to get recognition and also, like, to get feedback on whether what you're working on is actually a good contribution, a significant contribution uh, to your area. So. Uh, you should like you need to write and publish papers and uh, definitely publish try to publish and like top tier conferences and journals. Uh, most professors actually have a minimum requirement for their students. Like they may say that you need you to have at least 
uh, three conference papers or uh, you know like one conference and you know, two journal papers or something like that, depending on the area you're working. In. So they will tell you upfront what their uh, minimum requirement is for you to graduate. Uh, try to maintain a good cadence, like at least one or two papers every year, because otherwise it gets very stressful if you have to publish five papers in one year. And uh, bear in mind that even the best papers can get rejected from top tier conferences for some reason or the other. So it's not that you publish to a conference and your paper will get through. Sometimes you may have to face rejection. So it takes a while to get these, uh, get all your work published. So that's why I said, like, have a good cadence and try to get at least, like, one paper published every year. And the way to publish them, you know, like, the way to find collaborators with uh, other researchers in your field. So the conferences, you go and talk to different people. You know, you give a talk from somebody at a conference. You go to that person. If you're really interested in working with that, um, like, network with them, follow them. Internships are also like another way to get uh, uh, papers. Also, they, they might just be useful, like you know, for uh, like getting some good research experience, even if you do not publish. Uh, like for instance, industry internships are very useful if you uh, plan to uh, pursue a career in the industry, uh, and uh, if you want to like work in academia, you should apply to like academic labs and schools. Um, most of the labs and schools, uh, I don't know if they have like formal internship programs, but if you like so somebody in uh, a lab you're interested in working in, then I'm sure it's like some people, some of the professor or the students will respond to. And try to find a project that's close to your PhD uh, research, because if you can publish this work, one, it can be included in your dissertation, and then you can, you know, you, you're satisfying the requirements that your advisor or your department may have, that you need like three publications, you get one through your internship. Like, I, I actually did that. I had uh, three papers through my park and uh, something research to those to which means went into my uh, the end of the so I, I pretty much did like completed half my uh, requirements of PhD uh, through my internship. And uh, this one is uh, FYI for international students, like make sure you get the PhD uh, requirements at school. I don't know how many international uh, students are in the participants, but find out this from your school and uh, make sure you take care of these requirements. Uh, so after you've been working in this problem stage for a while, then at the end of like fourth year, it's time for you to propose your uh, thesis. So for a thesis proposal, you formulate the problem that you're working on. All the work that you're doing, there should be a story that ties it together. So like I described two of my works, uh, location, uh, in, in localization and activity recognition. So there was a story behind inferring all these different dimensions of the user and then using it for like doing something like personalized recommendations or uh, whatever. So you have, need to have a story that ties everything together. Uh, then you propose or like you present the story or you write them to present it to a committee of about three or four uh, like professors uh, will be your committee members and then they decide whether this is like a significant contribution whether this is worth pursuing a PhD in, and, and they will uh, tell you that when you pass or fail. So, uh, but most of the time like uh, your advisor would have actually told you already so it's really, uh, it's not such a you know, huge hurdle to pass uh, because your advisor is your guide so your advisor will keep telling you and guiding you at each point. He or she sees that uh, you're uh, pursuing a problem state or you're working in something that may not be considered a significant contribution, then that person will tell you. Uh, now we like we come to the last key milestone, which is basically you defend and apply for jobs. So you finish your thesis work, you have a, a thesis uh, proposal, you know what you're going to do for the rest of your uh, PhD, you finish it up and you, uh, uh, you're ready to defend. But before that, you, uh, you should like at least like start applying for jobs because uh, one, it makes it less stressful and also job hunting takes about two, three months on an average. It may take more in academia. I did not apply for academic jobs, so I really cannot say much on that, but uh, I know like at least in the industry, it takes about two, three months. So for academic jobs, like you, uh, you need uh, materials like a CV or a statement, you go to different universities, you give a talk on what you've been working on, what your PhD work has been on, and then you know, like why it's important, uh, what, like how, uh, you know, how much effort you put in, what's the exciting thing about it. And uh, you should like definitely ask your advisor on guidance on where to apply for like postdoc or if you want to apply for assistant professor uh, positions, uh, you, you, like definitely ask for guide, uh, advisor for guidance. Uh, in the industry, uh, you typically figure out yourself where you want to work on. I mean, your advisor can guide you, but it's more like where, you know, you find a good match of work uh, team members, uh, you know, like the company and things like that. And also like location may matter to some people. For me, it matters. So it may matter to some people like where the company is based. Uh, so you prepare your CV, you apply to the, the different teams and companies that you just do. You can like use LinkedIn or, you know, just look up company websites. 
you should definitely get a network, uh, use your network to refer uh, you for open positions. Like ask a friend on LinkedIn or who are already placed in the industry to uh, refer you to open positions. Uh, then you go and interview. If they're interested in you, they should be shot. If you and they will call you for interview, you have to prepare for these interviews. There's a whole ton of material out there on preparing for industry interviews, so I'm not really covering that here, but if you just look it up, it's, uh, a lot of it is out there. And uh, you may also need references from your advisor, internship men men uh, mentors, or your uh, professors. So that brings an end to my talk. And uh, if you guys have any questions or you want to email me your feedback, your feel free to email. Hi, Preeti. Wow. That was a lot of great information. Thanks, Laurie. Uh, we have time for uh, two questions that have come in, and then I think we're going to take the rest of them on online uh, oh, sure. through chat. So the first question to you is, uh, what was it that made you feel like grad school was the right choice for you? Why, why did you go on to grad school? Uh, so like I said, I did research as an undergrad. And uh, while doing research, uh, if, I, if you remember what I said initially, it's basically you realize whether you like research or not. And I realized through my undergrad, uh, undergraduate uh, internship that I really wanted to do research in this area, like basically the field that I went, went on to do my PhD in. And uh, that's why I decided that you know, after my undergraduate, uh, I would do a PhD. But uh, due to like personal constraints and you know other things, I decided not to do it immediately after my undergraduate. So I worked for three years and then I applied for uh, for PhD in uh, universities in the United States. And uh, mm -hmm. that's basically what led me. So it really depends on how what you are interested in. If you're really interested deeply in an area, you want to know more about it, and you want to contribute to it, uh, definitely PhD. You know, is like you should you should do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, one one more question online, and that would be, uh, what was it in the admissions process that you thought was the most stressful, or the um, most surprising? I think the most, uh, I wouldn't call it stressful, but what uh, needed the most effort was the statement of purpose, because you are actually put in, in two pages, you need to write what you've worked on so far, in, uh, you know, like what has shaped you, and what you're interested in, and you know, what, what what qualities you have, what can you bring to the table, what you can contribute to. So it has to be like really strong and also like outline your past and your you know future aspirations uh, very well. So statement of purpose definitely is uh, like the key piece, I would say, when you're applying to graduate school. And there is like, uh, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of material out there to how, you know, which would guide you on how to write a good statement of purpose. I think I have like a, a document on my website as well in one of the links that I mentioned that says, you know, like how to write a good statement of purpose. And every university also, like most of the universities I saw actually had something or the other out there. So uh, there's like no sort of material on, you know, like uh, the application material basically. Oh, that's great. Okay, I think we need to close this out. Um, so, let's see, could you move the slide, Preeti? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so we want to make sure that we get feedback about these webinars so that we can continue to improve them for the future. So uh, you will see this uh, survey link or you can use this QR code to fill out the survey um, after the webinar completes. Uh, the next slide is on our next speaker uh, for February 8th at 5 p.m. Eastern time, so it'll be a little earlier uh, for the East Coasters. Um, and uh, it will be uh, Veronica from the uh, Oak Ridge National Lab. The last slide is um, on resources. Uh, lots of different resources online, as Preeti was suggesting. CRAW has a lot of resources, so we suggest that if you want more, um, to uh, go to the CRAW site for that. And we encourage you to stay on the line now. We're going to go into a chat, uh, an online chat forum. So we'll thank again our speaker, Preeti, for being with us this evening, and she's going to stay on for more questions. Uh, so please use the chat and I'm we sorry. thank you all.